Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, yeah, I, I'll take this talk to be somewhat informal, although I have a, a lot of material. I can stop at any point if you're bored. Okay. Um, so, um, what I decided to talk about, I, I met, uh, I met uh, Mr. Buell at uh, Bug Blast, and we were showing at Bug Blast our high speed video system. We, we have these really neat cameras that can capture insect flight in incredible detail. And in fact, this last weekend, we were at the Pacific Science Center um, where we, were, we brought our high-speed video cameras there. We filmed uh, animals, that we filmed butterflies in the Butterfly House. If you go to the Butterfly Exhibit, there's a high-speed movie that uh, just precedes your entrance into the Butterfly House, and that's done by our lab. So we, we really like high-speed video, and, and it's a lot of fun. And so you're going to see some high-speed videos. Uh, but I want to put them in context of some science questions that we're asking. So um, I, I, I decided to look at, to, to talk to you today, about a funny process that insects have to use. And that's how do they know where they are in space when they're flying. And a lot of my work, and, and I'll confess my background as an engineer, it's going to come out. I've tried to hide it <laughs> as best as I can. I left my pocket protector back in my office. Uh, you have a pocket protector from my class, I think. That's last day, you don't have one. I, I teach biomechanics, and we give all the graduating seniors pocket protectors. <laughs> um, so, and if you don't have yours, I have plenty more. Uh, so, uh, and I also want to begin by thanking uh, all of you for inviting me and, and my happy, happy laboratory. And I, I want to uh, actually take a moment to thank one of my mentors who passed away recently, is John Edwards, uh, an entomologist at the University of Washington, an incredible man, an incredible gentleman. He's been uh, serving as a mentor of my students for years. He moved into my lab when he became emeritus. It was a pleasure having him there. So the, the faculty on the top are actually now uh, mentored by all of these students here. We have uh, undergraduates, graduate students, a whole range of postdocs. And, of course, the faculty and the emeritus faculty, uh, John Edwards and Trish Morris. Um, so really quickly, uh, just about what goes on in my lab, and then we'll dive down into some fun problems. Uh, I have a, a small group that works on the sensory information processing in insect flight control. And um, with a, a, a nod to Gary here, we understand how important the visual system is. <laughs> Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. And, uh, but you still need to know where you are in space, separate from the visual system. You need to disambiguate some things. And visual systems, as you will learn, are wonderful, and again, not to Gary, but not the fastest sensory systems in the world. And some insects need to know where they are very quickly, faster than the visual system can provide that information. So we're going to talk about that. And there's a classic example of how insects know it, and it's not known in the Lepidoptera, period, how they do this. So this is the Washington Butterfly Group. I have a lot of open problems for you. I'm not going to answer them because they're open, uh, but I'm going to raise them. And I brought with me a, a Lepidoptera, particularly a butterfly a taxonomic character. Uh, there's a lot of my lab uh, has uh, focuses on, on muscle. And it turns out that the muscles that run the wings of the Lepidoptera behave like human cardiac muscles in terms of how they generate force, in terms of how they're stretch sensitive. In fact, they're forming a model system for human cardiac mechanics. And so we get money from the National Institutes of Health for studying moth muscles. And you know, I kept, yeah, you know, every time I'm on an airplane, somebody's sitting next to me, and what do you do? I just do moth muscles. Uh, you know, <laughs> that's, a, that's a hard one, too. To justify, but in fact, they do behave like cardiac cells. Um, and then a, a large group is focused on how all animals, leps, uh, dipterin, other insects, uh, birds, I don't really care, all animals use lots of sensory information, visual, mechanical, chemical, use multimodal sensory information to regulate how they move in space. And this is called the sensory motor transform. That is, how do you take sensory information? How do I do it? How do you do it when you walk? How does an insect do it when it flies? How does it package that sensory information into motor commands that drives the muscles in a coordinated and effective manner? 
That's not a solved problem in about anything. That's a hard problem, is how does the brain convert sensory information to motor commands? That's a toughie, it's a fun one, and it's one we work on, and that's also funded by a, a variety of agencies. So, this is my favorite video. This was done by one of my graduate students. Very <laughs> 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 But it does let you know the importance of sensory information. I can play it again. This was on the. Uh, this actually made it oddly onto the Jay Leno show uh, as uh, one of uh, the week's greatest <laughs> films. This uh, was filmed just outside uh, the Kincaid Hall in the uh, medicinal herb garden. Oh, yeah. There's a little pond there. And we have several movies of this, and it looks like we've just done the movie over and over again. It's the, I swear it's the same frog and the same <laughs> uh, uh, dragonfly. The dragonfly came back to the perch, the frog goes, I'll try again. <laughs> it was over and over again. This is so wonderful. You have to do wire release recapture. Now, one of the things I wanted you to notice is when that frog went off, there is an entire motor program. And, yeah. assume, and you know, it, it just, it was all feed for it, yeah. right? Just, I've got, you know, I just, it does the whole thing the tongue, the mouth, the sort of disappointed look. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it's an interesting problem. Yeah. Um, this is a film we did in the Butterfly House uh, at, uh, you know, this is actually out in the Pistol Burger. Oh, wow. And um, what I want you to note here is uh, wings are deforming tremendously as these move around. And um, in this movie here, I have one of our hawk moths flying and, and hovering in front of a flower. And um, you'll see some more examples of this in a minute. And our lab has been really interested in how animals control their movement. This is a very, very large deformations of the wing, the sort that would uh, bother a Boeing engineer. Um, <laughs> and um, as, as you learn, um, these animals are richly sensed. That is, their entire body is very heavily imbued with sensory structures. I'm going to start going into this in a little more detail. Obviously, they have these fabulous eyes. Now, unlike many of the day flying labs, these corpuscular or night flying moths have fairly large eyes and have fairly um, slow vision, meaning that they are processing a lot more light per year, a lot less light per unit time. And so it's like their shutters are open for a very long time, just like a camera under low light conditions. And that turns out to be a bit of an issue that I'm going to bring up. So um, part of the lab looks at how um, the aerodynamics, aerodynamic, aerodynamic forces generated by the wings. I'm actually not going to talk about that today. It's fun, it's exciting, but it's, it's really just engineering. And, and I can assure you there's a lot of interest in this on the part of the Air Force, on uh, the part of uh, this whole area of what we call micro air vehicles. And I, I, I decided to talk about the other side, not the mechanics of flight side, but the sensory side. But I need the two together to explain why this is an issue. So let me, let me just go over uh, some aspects of this particular animal. I have an example of it here. This is Manduka sexta. This is the hawk moth, tobacco horn one. Um, and uh, we raise these, have been raised uh, for, I think, 50 years uh, in, uh, in the, uh, at the University of Washington. We've had a long standing colony for a very long time, but 38 years to be exact. And um, we, these are now a model system. We have a fair knowledge of their genome. These aren't quite at the level of the fruit fly where we know basically everything can manipulate the genome, but we're getting there. So these are becoming model organisms. Um, they were studied early on because they were passed to, to one of the solanaceous plants, tomato, tobacco, and others. So it's the same species as the tomato one, correct? Uh, yeah, Manduca sexta. Okay. okay. Um, common names. And um, it's got about a Wingspan of 10 centimeters, uh, it's about 2 to 3 grams, and the wings beat at about 25 hertz, 25 times per second. And I'm actually bringing that one figure up for a reason. That is, 
each wing beat is about 40 milliseconds. So <laughs> 40 one thousandths of a second. So to your eye, you don't see the wings beating. To your eye. Uh, because your fusion frequency of your eye is, is slower than their wing beat frequency. So that's why we need these great cameras. Okay? <clears throat> uh, they gather sensory information. They're richly, uh, as I said, reviewed with sensors. And of course, one of the classics is chemosensory information. These animals can detect a pheromone, an extremely, sex pheromone, extremely low concentrations. They can detect host plant odors and the like. Okay? They have the chemosensory structure, obviously, in their antennae, the astatas and cilla, and on their feet, their tarsi. And interestingly, recently, we've just learned that their wings are filled with chemosensory structures. Uh, that was not known until uh, quite recently. Okay? So they are basically tasting the air as they fly through it, which I find fascinating. Um, uh, of course, uh, they have visual sensory systems. They have low light sensing um, and with a very high latency. So they can see under dark conditions, but it takes them a long time to get the image, that's what that says. Um, these animals, I, you know the ocelli, ocelli uh, that are the extra eyes on the head, uh, these are said to be an ocellus, and not to have external ocelli, but to have them under the head capsule. I have no idea what they're doing. Gary? Okay, then nobody knows, all right? Uh, uh, but they're doing something. They, you to, they totally are. Yeah. Uh, they're, you know, it could be horizon, it could be up, down, we, we don't know. It, they've not been studied. In training? Could be just, it could just be daily rhythms. Right. Yeah? This may be way off base here, but is there, way off base. is there any connection with the mechanics of this and a hummingbird? Oh, I mean, yeah. The bird work yeah. At all? yeah. Uh, these, these are often, some closely related species, the lephala, for example, is often mistaken for a hummingbird. And I've periodically gotten a call like, what is the hummingbird in our garden with antennae? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so they beat the same weight, same wing length, same wing beat frequency, same wing morphology. If you look at the shape of a, a hummingbird wing, it's very similar to some of these really outstanding flyers. Yeah, that is a great question. It's not at all off the base. Yeah? Uh, I just remember this back in our your lecture from last year. You had talked there was something special about when the uh, wings had got to full extension. There was, I, I just re remember there was something that the insect had done something special that allowed it for better flight mechanics. Yeah, yeah, so uh, what's your name? Jay. Jay took my biomechanics class. And it turns out the aerodynamics of flapping flight is, is a non-trivial problem. So when we built up all of aerodynamics and aeronautical engineering, it was based on something called fixed wing aircraft. There are relatively few airplanes that I've been on that flap. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, there have been a few flights where it's very close. Uh, lots of turbulence. Uh, <laughs> lots of turbulence. Uh, but it turns out that um, early on, when you use the sort of engineering that goes with fixed wing aircraft, you cannot explain how an insect holds its weight up in air. It's insufficient aerodynamic forces based on the classical and it actually took a teams of biologists and engineers working together to actually solve the aerodynamics for a wing that rotates and when it comes together, this is what you're referring to, the wings sometimes get so close that they interact with each other and generate novel aerodynamic forces, things that no airplane would ever do. Right? So that, that is, I think, what you're referring to. Um, I, I will just say, for those of you with interest, there's another hire we just made, Eddie Michael Dickinson, who we just, uh, about a year ago, brought up from Caltech. He's a professor of bioengineering. He says fruit fly fly. Fruit fly fly. <laughs> uh, and he, to understand the aerodynamics, he built a giant robotic fruit fly. Wow. Now, careful. If, if the fruit fly wing is this big, the aerodynamics of moving a wing in the air don't match. So he has a giant chamber of mineral oil in which the giant fruit fly so he robot, scales the viscosity? He scales the viscosity. So, so he has this giant robotic fruit fly doing fruit fly wing motions. And it's just totally awesome. 
uh, a little weird. Uh, That's right. But uh, I, I, he was actually a graduate student of John Polka, who was an uh, uh, insect physiologist. Yeah. So what's the largest moth or hummingbird in the world that can do this type of flight? What's Hovering flight? Yes. I think these are the largest that easily hover. There's an owl moth in, in, that I'm aware of. You guys may know this better than me. I, I suspect you do. The Panamanian owl moth that one of my graduate students filmed hovering. It's got a wingspan of about like that. It's just oh. beautiful. Just, and I have it in, in, pinned in my lab. It's just a huge wingspan. Uh, but uh, unlike uh, hover, hovering flight birds, which I think was what you're alluding to, there's a certain size limit which you can no longer hover. You know, frankly, Manduka is one of the largest flying insects in terms of body mass. It's a very large body. It's not, its wings relative to its body mass are not particularly large. They're more like a hummingbird. The largest winged uh, moth I know is the, uh, is, is the Panamanian owl moth. And its body is actually considerably smaller. Um, so they're not up against that famous size limit for hovering flight. Uh, hovering flight size limits are on the order of, uh, of a small quail, just very small quail, uh, just maxing out there. Okay, that's great. I may not make it through my whole talk, which is great. I, I don't need it. <laughs> uh, and this series of sensory inputs fly into the nervous system, uh, and I'll show you the nervous system. Just love the brain of a moth. And uh, it actuates a whole series of structures. Wings, the abdomen, legs, head, and the antennae are all actuated very actively during flight. There's muscles holding the antennae in a particular angle during flight. This is classically seen as well in all the labs of the butterflies. Uh, the abdomen in large uh, laps is moved considerably during flight. And that early movie I showed you has that abdomen just flying back and forth as the animal is trying to negotiate its path like a person in a hang glider shifting their weight relative to the center of the left. Okay. Um, so, this is how my lab thinks of things. This is a boring slide. The movies are so much nicer. But, um, so I start in the upper right corner. We get some sensory input. The central nervous system processes it. It packages it into motor commands. It drives contraction of muscles. The muscles actuate the thorax in a really beautiful and not well resolved manner. So you know that in the Lepidoptera, these large muscles in the thorax deform the thorax and by some very bizarre articulation make the wings move. And it was argued to be a very simple mechanism, but as we look more and more at it, we understand less and less of the sort of drivetrain between how the muscles generate force and how the wings are moving. It's a really wild linkage. Yeah? Well, the moths, of course, length their front and hind wings together. Is the musculature significantly different butterflies? Not significantly different. Um, um, both of them have these large thoracic uh, dorsal longitudinal muscles that run fore for and aft, and then a, two sets of dorsal ventral muscles. Um, I think, you know, I, I don't know butterflies as well as you do, and I have never studied their musculature. I only went to moths. I, I think these guys have pack more power per thorax than butterflies. They're just huger, larger thoracic volumes for a given wingspan. But they have that sort of mesothorax that's combined with the musculature. But they don't have butterflies when you have a separate set of musculature for the hind wings. No, and in fact, there's some independence of the hind wings and these. We, we certainly see them, not like a, not like a dragonfly, which yeah, right. separately. But there is some independence. And we also see uh, wing stroke to wing stroke changes in the splay of the pair of wings. They're not rigidly locked, and they can sort of spread them like sails a little bit and change their, their tensioning. Uh, and again, none, this is all just description. None of that's been very heavily studied. Yeah? So does the frenulum stretch then? It's not so much the frenulum that's stretching, it's the wing membrane itself, the intervein spaces are, are being spread apart like a parasail. But they are right. hooked together. They are hooked together by that frenulum right there, right at that leading edge of the hind wing and the trailing edge of the forelimb. Hmm. So it's, it's, you know, the Chinese sail, which has these veins that you can pull up uh, on the boats. Mm -hmm. So they, they're actually, the, the sclerites, the 
these, which are running by very small muscles at the wing hinge, slightly shift the gearing of the wing. So it may come forward a little more relative to this one, sort of spreading it a bit more. Tension in the wing differently. Probably giving rise to different bending dynamics, and therefore different aerodynamic forces. It's kind of fun. And I'm giving you the, that's, a, that, that, that's as deep as we know this. So it'll be, it's really a tough problem. Um, but let's go right into the sensory and just make sense of things, as I say. Um, so uh, we began this a few years ago with this, uh, what we call Robo Bush at the time. Uh, so Michael Dickinson has Robo Fly, but we have the bush that moves around. And one of the amazing things is uh, we have this bush of flowers, and one of the flowers is actuated. We can, it's robotically controlled, and a moth is, is, is rather motivated to feed. I mean, the, these moths are, will feed, uh, if we give them enough nectar, to the point where they just fall out of the air. They just cannot sustain it. <laughs> so so um, what we're showing you is this incredible ability to track a moving flower. And I challenge any of you to lick an ice cream cone. <laughs> um, and, and this is not a good thing. This is real time. I'm not just playing the same thing over and over again. And, and you can move in any direction. And you can change it. Up and it's kind of fun. So, Tom, do you do white noise? Yes, we are doing white. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, but that, I don't have to move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, and, and not very white bandwidth. Well, <laughs> yeah. So instead, what we we actually don't do white noise. We do. Uh, okay. Yeah, we well, just do a composition of sound waves. But that's a it's a signal analysis. Thing. We'll share our pocket protectors later. So <laughs> um, uh, it's powerfully visually motivated. Um, there was a beautiful experiment done. So a lot of people look at this, and it looks like you're grabbing their proboscis and shaking them. And, and a, a, a group in, in, in Germany actually asked the question, is the proboscis providing the critical sensory information that's allowing them to track the flower, or is it the eyes? How could you do an experiment, they asked, that would disambiguate whether it's the proboscis or the flower? And they actually, if you saw them want the flower going back and forth and the moth just went back and forth, what they did is they had a screen with a hole in it and a projected image of a flower. The moth came up, put its proboscis in the screen, and then they made the flower expand and contract visually against the fixed screen. If the proboscis was providing the sensory cue, they wouldn't move. But if it was the eyes, they'd go back and forth, and then sure enough, they went back and forth. I thought that was, I love experiments that are simple and unambiguous. I'll show you some really complex and highly ambiguous ones myself. Um, okay, great. Powerful visual statements. So here's what I want to do very quickly is, uh, how do we measure sensory information processing? What are the consequences of sensor delays that I referred to? How do insects measure gyroscopic forces? Right, that, that's where I want to end up. I may not make it all the way down. Okay. Um, so, what modalities are involved? Chemosensory, uh, mechanosensory, those are blue, uh, wings of mechano, and of course, visual sensory. And this is my. Uh, <coughs> Gary, again, the visual systems are extremely powerful. And in fact, you can record from them. This is a splay out of the brain of Manduka, by the way. Uh, oh, wow. Optic lobes on either side, the antennal lobes are right here, and the antennal nerves are running up there. This is the motor control region of the brain. Just like in us, I have a motor control region right here, uh, and I have a premotor center there. They have the same thing. And one of the things I'm quick to point out to public audiences is if you are interested in the human brain, look to a moth brain. I still can't understand that one. It's operating with exactly the same principles as human brains. They're acquiring information, processing information, making decisions. Turns out their decision-making circuit behaves similarly to a primate. They learn. We can show learning. They memorize. They count. Ants count, right? We know these things. And if you want to understand a brain, why start a human? We don't even understand these. So this is my other pitch. But I won't go too deep, except to say that you can open up the head. This is a drawing of the brain. There's a particular region here. It's called the lobular plane. So these three regions are associated with 
<coughs> visual image processing, just like in our brain. And in fact, it's a remarkably similar circuit, disturbingly similar circuit, for how motion is detected in our brains, primate brains, bee brains, moth brains. Just the solution was found early on, and it's been used over and over and over again in evolution. And you can take an electrode, a very tiny one, and insert it into the brain. Actually, let me be really specific. You can insert it into one cell in the part of the brain that's seeing the world around. One cell, okay? Inside one cell. So it's a teeny electrode. Like you're looking at me like I'm just nuts. Um, um, I am. <laughs> so, and, and we do that. And then we play a movie in front of the animal with the head open, an electrode in one cell. And you can actually identify what's called motion sensitive cells in the brain. And there are ones like this one. When we make the world move to the right, it's excited by movement to the right, and it is, uh, sorry, it's inhibited by movement to the left. And what you're seeing over there is the actual recording of electrical activity of the cell. Here is where the world moves to the left, and it's inhibited, and I'll go back a slide. <clears throat> and here's, uh, sorry, here's where it's moved to the right. I call this the Romney cell. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, there, 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 well, there are Obama cells and, and, and there are Schwarzenegger cells that are. And, uh, but, I'm sorry, you're not supposed to make political jokes. <laughs> it's not a joke, it's just right word versus left. Um, and um, what I want to point out is, and this is where the you know, confusion started is these are optimized for detecting motion under low light. These are moths, not day flying, nymphalids or whatever. These are night flying or crepuscular flying animals. And because of that, it takes their, their nervous system a little bit of time to gather sufficient information to know the world has moved. And that little bit of time turns out to be about 100 to 200 milliseconds. It's a little bit of delay between the time the motion starts and the actual time that the cell sees it. And to all of us, you know, what's 100 milliseconds? It's a tenth of a second. Big deal. But if you're a wing beast, it's about 40 milliseconds. Let's say it's 120. I'm being conservative. You've gone three steps before your visual system knows you've moved. So, 100 to 200 millisecond latency. Is that a problem? So I had this postdoc, Ty Hedrick, who was this brainiac from the planet Encephalon. And he <laughs> um, developed a computer program. I'm just going to tell it to you. I'm not going to show you the code or the equations. Right? And the way it worked is he said, I know the aerodynamic forces generated by the wing. I know how wings move. I can specify that wings go like this, wings go like that, and wings go like that, in any combination. He actually used a computer program to solve the motions of the wing that would let an animal hover. Okay? He actually mm -hmm. solved the hardcore engineering, published it, it was beautiful work. I consider it one of the best products I've ever had. And he used this really complicated genetic algorithm, letting all the parameters evolve in time and have mutations and genes. And it's just a very bizarre thing. You don't need to worry about this, but we calculated or dynamic forces from some wing motions asked where did the animal end up at the end of a wing stroke. Did it work? Uh-oh, I'm too far. So I redo a next wing, try it again, and I keep trying different wing strokes until I'm exactly where I want to be. And then I circle around and I do it again and again and again. How, how stable is this? And so rather than show you the equations, I'll show you the movie. The upper one is the real model. The lower one is the computer version of it, and it's doing pretty well. He could get the wings to move in a way that's pretty, pretty close. And the virtual moth hovered beautifully. But there was a big, gory problem. We, in order for us to solve this problem, we had to calculate what happened at the end of each wing stroke every 40 milliseconds. The visual system isn't fast enough for the brain to know that. So I said, well, Ty. Let it go two wing strokes, like do 80 milliseconds. It should still work. And this is, this is the best he could do. 
is this is the uh, two wing stroke delay, an extra 40 milliseconds. And, um, you know, uh, <laughs> not so good. Uh, oh. Oh. And that is a real simulation of the best one we could get to work. It's an unstable process. I'm going to show it to you one more time because I want you to observe what happens when the virtual animal is not given information fast enough. Mm. Right? I want you to observe this. And then we're going to do an experiment. So if the animal is, it goes into this weird, what we call pitch instability, with whoa, 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 and it starts to spin off control. I will preface this by saying, I'm going to make a moth do that. Okay? A real one. Okay. So the moth, according to our math, cannot fly, and now I apologize, with just the visual system. It cannot maintain stable flight if its visual system is every, if it's too slow. So it ha there has to be some other way that the moth knows what its body is doing. Something not visual. So sensor delays with imprecision can be taken stability. That's my conclusion. This is what nature came up with. I have a demonstration. Okay. Up there is a dipterin, aptly named, because it has two wings, diptera. The hind wings are reduced to a little knob-like structure here that counter-oscillates with the wings. It's called the halter. At the base of the halter are hundreds of strainness sensors, hundreds of stretch sensitive neurons, right at the base. What is the fly doing with the halter? It turns out the fly needs its halter, it has its forewing and its hindwing, and it does this motion, right? The halter is this, this is the way, okay? And it does this at flying wing beat frequency. And it generates something called a Coriolis force in the following way. Bear with me. It acts like a gyroscope. So here's how a gyroscope works. If I take a bicycle wheel and I spin it like this, I have a mass spinning in a circle. And if I try and rotate myself in an axis orthogonal to it, I get a weird thing called the torque. So if any of you just hold a spinning wheel and just turn it, it fights you as you try and turn it. That's part of why your bike stays up. It's got this beautiful gyroscopic force that follows from something called the Coriolis equations. But we call it gyroscopic force, okay? And don't worry about this. The neural system of the fly hind wing, that halt here, is hardwired to the motor circuit of the forewing. So as it gets stretch information, it actually changes the motor program of the wing faster than the brain can do it. And it does it at every wing beat. And in you fact, the brain, what? Right? you don't need circuit. the brain. It's all local. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And it's so fast. In fact, it's not even a typical neural connection. It's so fast. It's a, it's, most neurons communicate with each other chemically at their ends. These are electrically coupled. It's wickedly fast communication from the torque sensor down here and the wing motor up there. That is nature's solution to fast corrections. And the Lepidoptera do not have Tears. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they don't have whole tears. They have line waves. Okay. Okay. I'm going to take you down the path where we are now, and I'm going to tell you we're probably wrong. But let me keep going. If you cut the whole tears off a fly, it cannot fly. It can't fly. Okay. Uh, vision and mechanical reception have to be working together in flies, and that's been shown very well. And recent neural data by a graduate student in my lab, Jess Fox shows that even the slowest, biggest halter is the crane fly halter. We picked that because the crane flies you know, good size. The halters are about a centimeter long. It turns out we could do the neural recording and show that they're actually measuring gyroscopic forces. Uh, Jess, by the way, just got a job as a professor, assistant professor at Case Western. So I'm going to pass through this. So halters encode Coriolis forces. So I have this juxtaposition. I've done this to you on purpose. The dipter have a mechanism, a 
gyroscope for correcting your flight path. And the left adopter are not known to have it. Tell me some key features of the butterflies. What's a key butterfly feature? What, what's a, maybe a feature that sets the butterflies separate from moths? No, no, no. Oh. <laughs> Good luck. Knobby ones, too. Yeah. See, I brought this for a reason. <laughs> I had a postdoc come up from Berkeley, a guy named Sanjay Sane, and we were filming moths. And Sanjay said, geez, those antennae wiggle a lot while they're flying. Mm. And I said, wouldn't it be funny if those were the gyroscopes? And Sanjay, this is just fabulous Indian guys. I think they're very likely to be giants. <laughs> and, and they are. Uh, so let me explain what Sanjay did. Uh, <laughs> Sanjay, who uh, said, here's how a moth flies. I want you to get, the, get in the mood. This is a moth flying around. This is with infrared lighting. It's very dark conditions. It's, and under dark conditions, their eyes adapt to very large pupil, pupils. Yeah, pupils, pseudo pupils. And it's just moving around. That's what moths do. You can see the antennae being held at a characteristic 120 degree angle. Do you remember that movie I showed you of what happens if you, the moth, the virtual moth, doesn't get the information passing? And if the antennae were cut off, oh, don't worry. So um, Armin Hinterworth and Sanjay work together, and he just cut off the antennae. He left the base of the antenna intact, just took off the most of the flagella. And um, we flew them again, and this is what happens with no antenna. And remember that pitch instability? Oh, no. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> Time and to try loading them up so the dynamics was slower instead of faster. Hang tight. We do okay. more better. <laughs> so, Armin and Sanjay go, let's glue the antenna back on. <laughs> so they went to the greenhouses at UW and got tiny little cactus spines. Oh, Put the little cactus spine inside the antenna that was cut off, a flagella. Those are the flagella we cut off. And he just spent, he put it back on. And <laughs> there's the moth with the antennae reattached. Wow. Okay. You see it? No problem. They fly on. Oh, that's so cute. Okay. So I, I like that experiment. Um, we've since gone on, this was published in Science. Uh, we got a lot of weird press uh, on this. <laughs> Scientists use crazy glue to show that moths can fly. <laughs> That's not exactly what we're trying, but. Um, so, and the reason this works is here's how our whole tier works, is it goes up and down like this, and I'm gonna ask somebody to try this. <laughs> if you just do this, right, no problem. And when he turns abruptly, you're going to see this go into the weirdest path, and that's a radial torque. Okay? So go ahead and wiggle it, and then just rotate orthogonally. Faster. Fast. Okay, you see how all the dynamics that emerge? And that's because as he's going like this, you're going like that, and you end up with these weird accelerations, and the nervous system is picking it up. At the base, thank you. So, uh, <laughs> so how would how that do in your hand? And, and I'm, I'm, if time permits, I'm, I'm going to try and wrap up so you guys can all try this. So you can feel a Coriolis force. Uh, this is called a vibrating structural gyroscope. And all the gyroscopes that are in <coughs> things like your uh, iPhones that measure rotation, and many of the gyroscopes and new devices are exactly the same design. They vibrate instead of constantly spin. Okay, it's called a VSG, and that is the base of the head here has these amazing uh, array of sensory structures, hundreds of strain sensors in two regions. And this is true for all the Lepidoptera. In fact, all the insects have richly sensed mechanosensory structures at the base of the antenna. So when Sanjay and Armin cut off the antenna, they cut it here, leaving the sensory system in place. You can, in fact, cut off the antenna, glue on a little stick. It doesn't even have to be an antenna. It's just a mass, just like this, that excites the sensors down here. Okay? That's, yeah, that's what's going on. You can make prosthetic. Characteristic feature of the lepidopter is the knob. 
And the mass at the end is the thing that matters the most. And the moths have a very large, massive antenna. The, left, uh, the uh, butterflies have a much thinner antenna, but a mass at the end. And still to this date, I maintain there's considerable debate on the function of the knob. And our one hypothesis is it's important. Yeah. It's on a lot of butterflies, like say little ones, um, lysines and blues and hair streaks, and have um, they're not the antennas, but it's more than that. They're also striped, very high contrast striped. Yeah. I wonder if there's any visual. It's, it's, it's connection. certainly possible. Because it's, it's close possible. enough to yeah. you know do yeah. something. They can they can be measuring their angle a little bit. Yeah. And skippers have these weird knobs that are kind of yeah. hanging along the mm -hmm. end. They must get all sorts of weird. And kind of you know how they interact with the aerodynamic forces? Also, not known. So, as far as I know, the number of people studying antenna function in the LEPs is three mm -hmm. in the world. Sure. Sanjay Sunny in India. I think it's probably going to increase. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, our lab. And uh, now, two other labs that are beginning, it's just coming out now. There, there's one other thing that our lab discovered, Gary, and that is, um, and I didn't, I, I cut the slides out, but if, if you put, well, I'll show you what happens. Let me quickly go on. Um, can, one of the things is that you need both of these sensory modalities to run the world. You need vision, you can't run it just on the gyroscopes vision gives you this sort of integrated view of the world. The gyroscope is this sort of per perturbation measurement, right? okay, very rough, abrupt quick forces, right? And we wanted to know, could we build something that lets us tease apart how the brain is figuring out how much is, you know, how it weighs visual information and how it weighs, you know, the moth being bopped around. So we wanted to know if we could make a flight simulator for a moth, and, and, and so we did. Um, and if you look, this is an LED arena here, and we're controlling the luminance of these LEDs, okay? Right now, that LED is held stable, so the moth um, has a fixed visual reference point as it's rocked back and forth, and we can record from the nervous system the responses of the animal while it's in this, and we can separate out visual and mechanical signals in the light. That's really nice. Um, and, and we now have a really cool thing in our lab, again, if you guys want to see it at some point, let me know. We actually have a, a giant dome, a plastic, clear plastic dome with a data projector on the outside, and the moth is on the inside of the dome. And we project a visual world, and we track the reflexive responses to visual motion. And we actually let the moth fly its own world. We let, we, through our tracking, we feed it back into the computer so the moth can actually play a video game. <laughs> and we have them now flying in a forest that is virtual. It's a little bit. Um, <laughs> so, so there are reasons why we're doing that. Uh, it's, why would you have an insect play a computer game? Uh, the answer is we can ask how the brain is making decisions. That's really where we're going. So how does the brain decide what to do? How does a nervous system make a decision? And so we can change the nature of the forest, how much fog there is, how visually precise they have their world. Um, I'm going to skip this because I want to get sort of to the end, but uh, Armin and others in my lab have measured how the animal responds to all those motions. Um, they can respond by changing their wing stroke, they can respond by moving their abdomen, and they do a lot of abdominal motion. Uh, Armin, um, I'll just quickly go through this. Notice that the abdomen moves tremendously as the visual world is going up and down. What he's doing is tracking the abdominal angle. And so the latest paper we just had coming out now is that uh, when people studied insect flight, they said, oh, you know, the wings, that's where all the forces are. And so you just beat your wings, you just change your wing beat, right? And if you just change your wing beat, you'll get a different trajectory. But what we're finding is the whole airframe of the animal is deforming. And it really does it big time in butterflies, right? And it's basically you just take this big mass and move it around. It's like taking you know, economy in first class and articulating it. <laughs> and as you do that, where the lift force centers, you get pitch and uh, up and down pitch motion. It's a unique feature to flying uh, insects, and that is they articulate their whole body as part of the control. Um, 
And as it turns out, I think they're antennae or gyroscopes. But you know what? The abdomen, the brain knows where its abdomen is. The brain knows how bad it is. So just as the animal has these wiggling antennae, as it flies around, the abdomen is vibrating too. And we're very suspicious that the abdomen is also a gyroscopic sensor. So it's also an actuator and it's a sensor. That's unheard of in synthetic devices. You don't make your airplanes where your wings are telling you what your gyroscopic forces are. You have a separate gyroscope. Your wings are for producing lift. You have a separate engine. And you have separate sensors. Biology puts them all together. That's a unique feature. Uh, if you, by the way, cut off the antennae, the abdomen doesn't work. Okay? So that's over here is what they normally do. And when you cut the antennae off, the whole abdominal circuit is busted. And when you glue the antennae back on, you recover the circuit. Yeah? Did you try one antenna? Yes. And it works fine. They can fly with one. Redundancy. Yeah. Great question. Something else is going on that we don't understand um, hmm. is, so they're flying along and the world goes up, their abdomen goes up, and as it turns out, if you watch them closely, their antennae go up. <laughs> yeah, I had the same, what? You know, so the world's going up, they, they flex their body like that. If the world goes down, they flex the body like that. And the antennae are actuated under a visual stimulus. And this graduate student, Armin, I, I hesitate to tell you the experiment, but he said maybe there's a circuit all the way from the abdomen right back up, because he showed that if you cut the antennae off, the abdomen doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And what he did is he cut the nerve connection between the thorax and the abdomen, and, you know, the antennae kept moving just under the normal uh, visual reflex. And he said, well, it's either thoracic or it's all integrated in the head. And they said, well, Maybe it's just changing the set point of the sensor, so you're getting where you yeah. need it could be you know, that. the exquisite yep. information. It could be just a set point. So what he did is he said, well, if it's set point, it's all run by the brain. Maybe if I just took the head only and put the head in my flight arena, just the head. You put a little wax where the neck was, and so the fluid stays in. Visual system's still working, all the muscles are working, and long ball, and any track. Beautiful, just on an isolated head. Okay. A, a little peculiar, um, not the easiest thing to publish. Um, okay. Finally, uh, just just to really <clears throat> drive this home, we, we, we decided look, if the antennal position is important in regulating flight, and we could go in and take teeny teeny electrodes and insert them into the muscle at the base of the antenna. So this is a big blow-up view. Here's the base of the antenna. You can see it up there. And the antenna base has these beautiful muscles that hold it at different, different angles. And if you stimulate the muscle, you can get the antenna to do the sorts of things that the visual system is doing, right? And that's great. And, and you can stimulate it. You have this moth glued down in your lab. And you really can't tell what's going on. And we got into this pipe dream of wouldn't it be great if we can take the whole lab computer with all the electronics and the data acquisition and everything, just shrink it down into something a moth could fly with. Okay. A little science fiction. <clears throat> but that's what we did. Uh, so we noticed that in the lab, when we stimulate the antenna, we can get re reproducible antennal deflections. That's what we're showing there. And, and in fact, if you take the moth and you glue it to a stick and you stimulate the antenna, you can get it to turn right, left and right. That's still glued to a stick. So, so um, we built this little, we, we went, I, I, I used to play with radio airplanes. And uh, this is a radio airplane controller. And you'll notice it's been hacked uh, with our lab and the room at MIT and a bunch of electronics geeks. And there's sort of a little video computer, uh, radio controller for a little model airplane. And then we built up a little teeny chip. You'll see it. I brought it with me. It's about uh, 200 milligrams uh, plus 50 milligrams of battery. Okay. It's not very big, but it's got a whole little program chip on it. So it's got a programmable system on the chip, a little mini computer. And we, um, it has a little LED 
so we know when we're sending signals back and forth, we can visualize it. And then we attach that, uh, uh, that uh, to the ventral surface of the moth. There's a little harness it wears. And um, these are the moth's antenna here. This is the radio antenna there. Okay. This has got a teeny little antenna. And, and um, we then, uh, because we have now this moth with $10,000 of computing on it, uh, <laughs> we decided not to take it outside uh, and try and radio control it. So we built a wind tunnel. And this is now an EW. Pardon me? Keep away from that frog. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, it, it's more than $10,000. The computer itself is cheap. It's the, it's the time of people. Uh, it's about a year and a half of development on the big team. Uh, and the wind tunnel we can completely control. It's got a ton of high-speed cameras around it. And then we fly the moth in there. And there you see the light go on. We stimulate it. And we're getting our beautiful pitch motion. And you'll see that we can just do it over and over again to get the ball to pitch up, and then we can get it to pitch down, too. Uh, so we uh, spent a lot of time doing that. And we're just demonstrating that this is stimulating the antennae to get an upward pitch motion, which was what the hypothesis. And it's done without hands attached. All right, I'm just going to leave here. This is my last slide. Um, the diptera. <coughs> Uh, evolved these haltiers for incredibly accurate flight, for incredible agility. They, they're very fast windy frequencies, very agile flyers. And, and the idea is that the haltiers derive from wings and became gyroscopes. This I find inherently bothersome from a purely evolutionary. Nothing goes from an aerodynamic structure and then just becomes a gyroscope. It doesn't make sense, actually. Why would it? What, is, what are the intermediate forms that we get there? It doesn't make any evolution. Well, what about sense. all these insects that have four wings? Thank you. They fly pretty good. They fly darn well. What I've got here, uh, uh, something we're doing now in our lab, is if you take the scales off of the wings of, of the laps, and you look along the wing veins, they are completely packed with strain sensors that are the same exact type that we find in haltiers. Cool. The forewing and the hindwing have approximately, collectively, about 500 strain sensors on these wings. You go to a Boeing engineer and say, what are you going to do with 500 strain sensors on your wings? And they're done. Ignore 490 <laughs> something. I mean, they don't do that. They may make and measure tip deflection, and that's about it. Hmm. And I can tell you, I will tell you for a fact that if you just held the wings out and the animal was rocked in some direction, it will sense that. The nervous system will know that. We've recorded from these wing nerves. They're about the most sensitive mechanosensors we've ever seen in biology. They're as sensitive and precise as the mechanical as the auditory receptors for sound in owls. Those are the most precise mechanical receptors. In their dynamics? How fast? Uh, we can't wiggle the wing fast <coughs> enough to find out. Certainly over 500 hertz. They're so fast, so precise, and nobody knows what the strain sensors are doing on wings, what their function is. And every flying insect, every flying insect, is richly imbued with these, and their function remains unknown. We suspect that the wings are able to measure aerodynamic forces and also measure the gyroscopic forces of the body. That, in fact, it made sense that wings may have reduced to haltiers, always had a gyroscopic function. It was never a, a novelty. It was always there. It's just you reduce that wing just for particular aerodynamic characters of small dipterin flight. Um, honeybees. Uh, and all of the hymenopter, frankly, we have these wildly reduced hindwings that are richly sensed. So that's sort of where we are now, and this is a recent Air Force grant that we're working on, really on it, how to do that. So, uh, you know, I, my, my point is that I think insects are flying sensors, and the brains of insects are capable of processing information at rates that we had never thought possible. I think I'll just stop there and thank you for your patience.
Yeah, you, you had a question. So I'm just trying to 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 summarize what you said. The the wings have to have other sensors to to be able to be able to to, to fly correctly, and they're in the antenna, but they're also on the wings themselves. Yep. Is that? Yep. So as I I, I may have said briefly, <laughs> antenna. You're, you're right. Antenna, <laughs> neck, abdomen, abdomen. legs. Uh, we have some high speed videos of bees flying and the hind legs that hold the large pollen sacs, uh -huh. particularly orchid bees, as the animals fly, they're like, they're shaking at the same frequency as the wings. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think, you know, at the end of the day, these are just flying gyroscopes. And, and they're completely aware of their rotations in space. And when you have that many strain sensors, I can assure you a nervous system is fully capable of processing that volume of information. Fully capable. Does a dragonfly that has four wings and yeah. one wing yeah. independently? So dragonflies, yeah, and, and they have the same sensors. So this group of sensors, I, you know, I'll give you a little basic biology. They're, they fall into this category called campaniform sensilla, that is little dome-shaped uh, structures on the exoskeleton in which a single neural ending is embedded. And I didn't bring pictures of them. They're tiny, tiny, tiny structures. Few. My hundred microns in diameter. And as the skeleton deforms, it wiggles the nerve ending. It turns out that the characteristics of that nerve and the actual molecular machinery that determines uh, the force is called a trip channel. It's a protein that excites, it opens up and excites a nerve. Um, and it's the same one that's in our, our, in our hair cells in our inner ear. It's the same one we have in our nerve cells. It's a very standard bowl, a broad class of proteins that have been deployed in biology everywhere to measure forces. It's just a cool problem. Well, then the, the eyes, then, uh, if I understand this right, then, are basically fine tuning all of these other sensors that are being taken. I think, I think, uh, the eyes themselves. I, mean, I think, I think I would word it slightly differently. I think they're different temporal dynamics, that the eyes are really great at sort of the large scale, slower processes. And the mechano sensors are really good for perturbations and stability, and just like an auto-correcting system, right? They're, the, they're sort of the dumb part of the system, but fast. And the eyes are gathering information about horizon, complexity, objects, looming, edges, color, all of that other critical information. But that takes a longer processing time than you can afford for controlling yourself. I think it's a great question. So we would call it range fractionation in time. That is, the mechanical system is all for fast stuff. The visual system is slower, more complex stuff. Yeah, the visual system has to go through you know, big, long brain computer stuff. Yep. And this mechanical is just local circuits Hard. doing its own thing. And it isn't, isn't even. It, it goes, to go it to goes centrally. Come back to know what to do. Yeah, it goes right to the central part, just like the equivalent of our spinal cord. <coughs> yeah. With the olfactory organ in the antenna, does that have any impact at all? It, do the similar to what the eye does? Just yeah, olfactory is, is you know obviously it's used in, in, in odor tracking and, and, and tracking plumes and, and the pheromone plumes and, and, and host plant plumes and the like. So it tells um, it where to go. Yeah, it, it, you know, some people argue that the olfactory system is sort of the trigger for everything else. You, once you smell X, it, it sets off a decision to fly upwind, right? So you smell X, you want X, you fly upwind. That, that's your goal. If you don't smell it, you go into a different motor pattern of searching for the odor. It's called casting. And they sort of fly in this particular pattern. And when they catch the odor, they zoom upwind. So what the chemosensory system is, is exquisitely sensitive presence or absence of odor, to some extent the strength, but mostly it's setting off different motor programs, fly up wind or search. And, and that's how people think of it. In mosquitoes, it's a little different again. Uh, we have a woman in my lab studying how mosquitoes find a host, um, and the host release CO2, which is a big signature uh, flight circuit uh, modulator for mosquitoes. They also track temperature. So just like a chemical plume, we have temperature plumes around us. And the antennae have a rich set of <coughs> temperature sensors. And it turns out 
when the antennae are moved passively, it lets them detect the temperature more effectively than if they're not vibrated. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they're also auditory. That is, mosquitoes hear through their antennae. Mm -hmm. That's important. <clears throat> You said the insect will find its host plant by flying upwind when it finds the smell. What if it's a calm day and there's no wind? Yeah, so um, there's never no wind, uh, first of all. There's always sufficient wind, even a few centimeters a second, is sufficient to trigger uh, upwind behavior. And there's also gradients of density of those. Yeah. Uh, and, and they are visual, too. To, to, to be clear, um, getting to a patch of host plants is chemically mediated. Once you're at the patch, it's all visually mediated. That is, they're looking for the flower, and they literally visit flower to flower to flower. Great, great question. Yeah? You did some experiments with uh, neutralizing these gyroscopes in, in the software and, and moths. Have you ever tried doing that with the wings, where you, you may clip the wings or something? Yeah, and, yeah, it's a great question. So I had an undergraduate in my lab. Do the following, it, it, this is one of these great, <coughs> student, brilliant things. Uh, Spencer Howell um, said, you know, I was at the dentist and I had lidocaine in my tooth and it numbed my tooth. What would happen if I put lidocaine in the <laughs> And yeah, I, the typical me, I, oh, that sounds great, let's do it. <laughs> And he did. And we, you know, it's hard to say what's going on. And what we end up having to do is to prove first that the lidocaine is blocking uh, reversibly the sensory information coming from the wing nerves. So we actually had to do this really baroque experiment where you put lidocaine on it and we're recording from wing nerves electrically to see if it's doing anything. And we see the signal die on. And just like your tooth, after a while, you know, you metabolize off the lidocaine and yeah, the signal comes back on. So um, Darren is, I mean, that's as far as he's gotten. Now we want to just do the injection, watch the flight, and do the sham experiment of just inject uh, liquid, just uh, give water, basically sick. Great, I mean, it's essentially what you're asking. Why we're interested in the lidocaine is it's reversible. And, and also in nature, we often lay them in CDC butterflies with their wings virtually half or half. So they've got to be using some of those gyroscopes so they can buy it. Are they not in the cells? Are, are the, they're in the veins? Yeah. And the veins remain after the cells? Yeah, so, are more? so would that be? They lose, you can cut off a lot of the veins, by the way, yeah. and they'll still fly. Uh -huh. um, so this is the trick. Uh, to show, this is, a, this is a thorn in our lab. To show that if you remove structure X, <coughs> the animal still flies. It's not a statement that structure X isn't important. It's a statement that your measure of flight under those conditions, you did not see a difference. But under a challenge condition, you might. So one of the things that there's a person who studies cabbage whites in North Carolina, Joel Kingsolver, he's a great biologist. He did a, a much hairier experiment where he's wondering to what extent is the sort of Dynamics of the wing really important for survivorship. So flight is related to survivorship, obviously. So he would cut off parts of the wing. He could remarkably capture from thousands of cabbage whites mm -hmm. to see if there was a measurable effect of wing loss, and there is. You can't easily measure it in the laboratory that, oh, it flew. It's something about flight, maybe its ability to dodge or dive or tag or may. There are details of flight that we may never capture in our and that's where I think these bigger natural history experiments are really informative. They say, you know, the market captures if you lose 10% of your weight, in fact, there is a fitness consequence, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm sort of riffing a bit on your question that is it could go any which way <coughs> to show in our lab experimentally, you know, that antennal removal was, that's a very rare thing to see that level of a, a dramatic response. Mm -hmm. Usually they're fairly subtle. Usually, when you have 500 stain sensors, you can lose 50. Well, you still have 450, right? Yeah. And the outboard stuff is very thin. There's hardly any out there. Most of them are right in here. We didn't show them. So I would say about 200 are right there. The rest are outboard. <coughs> yeah? The conventional wisdom seems to be that uh, butterfly wings, lepidotal wings, are essentially inert. 
you know, they expand and then they're just dead yeah. tissue. But it sounds like there's some uh, lively connections. Oh yeah, yeah. They they're not actuated outward, obviously. But in fact, there's an immense amount of information flow from the surface of the wing inward. Um, wings are argued to play a variety of roles, not just in chemosensory and mechanosensory function, which we did talk about, but the regulatory. That is, um, there is a hemolymph flow a little bit in and out. The positioning of the wings are important in terms of how they uh, direct solar radiation to the thorax. So they're very, very actively involved, although out, they're very live. They're not dead. They're quite alive. Uh, a lot of butterflies would sit basking early in the morning. They'll sit and bask in the sun. So obviously, his wings are picking up yep. you know, heat and probably transmitting that to the main part of the body as well. Yep. One of the arguments for the evolution of wings in insects was the fact that they were associated with initially a thermal regulatory. And then they later <laughs> subsumed in their dynamic That's since been debunked, but I just love it because it makes sense to me. Um, <laughs> a lot of theory. And it was also done by a good friend of mine. I thought it was a great idea. It was written by Stephen Jay Gould. It was science. <laughs> yeah, it was all right. And it turned out not to be right. But um, and John Edwards, by the way, was one of its greater detractors. Uh, uh, and Joel and John were good friends. Yeah. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Small subsets of you want to visit the labs, we certainly welcome. Well, I think we'd like to do that. Too. <laughs> I can't do this volume, but I can do subsets.